thank you very much, Fred. Um, <coughs> as you've said, our aim is to produce a regular uh, updated estimate of fundamental equilibrium exchange rates. Uh, it uh, now seems to be agreed that this should be an annual event, and uh, so I think we'll aim to produce it roughly uh, this time each year. Uh, the uh, uh, past year has been one of pretty momentous changes in the world economy. I think there's no question about that. But many of the uh, changes are ones that one doesn't expect to have an impact on fears. Uh, as originally defined, as in its pure form, a fundamental equilib equilibrium exchange rate is supposed to be an exchange rate at which uh, you could conceive in the medium term of reconciling internal external balance for an economy. And uh, it's not clear why an ac a change in an actual exchange rate should affect those things which go into uh, calculating fears. Um, in fact, there are several ways in which, uh, uh, in, in practice, one expects that uh, actual fears are going to follow actual exchange rates. And uh, they seem to have done so to probably a larger extent than we would have uh, wanted. Um, to begin with, uh, it, as, as the way that we are estimating fears, we, we say that a country can uh, have a pretty wide swing in its current account. Uh, it was uh, depending upon what is forecast. We're, we're not going to try and bring it back to an exact balance. And that means that uh, if its change uh, results, a change in the exchange rate results in a change in the current account balance, then within a large magnitude, plus or minus 3% of GMP, we're simply going to accept that and not going to seek to reverse it. So that there is one reason why one expects actual exchange rates, I'm sorry, one expects fears to follow actual exchange rates. A second reason is perhaps rather less uh, legitimate, but in fact it's, it seems that it's quite probable, and that is that uh, when an exchange rate changes, the IMF doesn't always appear to build the pipeline effects into its forecasting model. It doesn't appear, one gets the impression that the fund is populated by elasticity pessimists, people who don't think that uh, uh, exchange rates are going to have much influence over uh, actual account account balances. And that's another reason why uh, one could conceive of actual uh, fundamental equilibrium exchange rate estimates following actual exchange rates in, in uh, practice. <coughs> so uh, that, that there, there's a problem uh, about uh, uh, the, the way in which uh, in principle, one measures fears. They, they may, in fact, have been affected by the appreciation of the dollar to give an impression that uh, some of the changes were more, they're going to be more sustainable than, in fact, they would be. Um, <clears throat> uh, but clearly, in principle, what one is after is an exchange rate which uh, consists, uh, which reconciles internal and external balance. It's uh, interpreted as being, there's no longer a problem about what in, that means in terms of internal balance. I think that uh, the, uh, the, the common uh, frequency of uh, uh, accelerationist views of inflation really puts paid to much debate about where countries are going to have to uh, go in the longer term on that dimension. But there's clearly a great deal of uh, room for divergent views on external balance because the, in, the, uh, uh, the <coughs> targets of external balance are offset by capital flows and capital flows are very variable in the world as we have it at the moment. I think one knows that. And uh, because of that, it's, um, th there's an ambiguity about the definition of the fundamental equilibrium exchange rate. Now, what we assume is that there are some limits on this flexibility, that beyond uh, a certain um, 
uh, range, uh, th there is still going to be a need to uh, bring exchange rates, uh, to, to bring uh, current account balances into equilibrium, and therefore we have a target for the current account, and uh, it's that which gives rise to the uh, target exchange rates. Uh, what we uh, look at in this um, uh, estimate is uh, uh, well, um, <coughs> the assumption, the two types of assumptions that uh, go into calculating fundamental equilibrium exchange rates. First of all, there's the notion, uh, there's the forecasts of the World Economic Outlook, where we use the, ja the April this year. Uh, Publication. It's the latest that's available, and it's forecast. Uh, it's based on the March level of exchange rates. It has data up to uh, almost the end of March, and so the March average is the closest that we could approximate. Um, but we are worried that in t in that forecast there is no substantial widening of the U.S. deficit even out into the indefinite future. And that is quite worrying to us because we have Klein's model. And this is a pretty sophisticated model, which uh, has, uh, in fact, forecasts that there will be a new widening of the U.S. deficit down the road if anything like March's exchange rates were perpetuated. Uh, and hence, we have a conflict between uh, either accepting the WIO analysis, which, assume, which disregards, the, which assumes that there are no pipeline effects of that type, or else the Klein model. And the problem with the, using the Klein model un unmodified is that it really doesn't have the detail about other countries that we're looking for. So we sought compromise. We decided to add to the surpluses of individual. We, we took the 2012 forecast by the IMF, and we modified it by adding to each country uh, a surplus, uh, which the sum of the surpluses would equal the increase in the U.S. deficit that is forecast by the time model. Uh, that's distributed in proportion to the trade with the United States, uh, and it's calculated to be equal to the high U.S. non-oil deficit. There's also a high oil price. So that is distributed in accordance with the country's net oil trade. Uh, so, so that's uh, what we, we did in, that's our assumption about what would have happened in the absence of policy change. Then the second type of assumption that we have to make is the policies that ought to be pursued. And what we have in mind here is essentially target current accounts. Uh, the current account targets, the basic rule, was that imbalances shouldn't be larger in the medium run than 3% of GDP. How do we get that figure? Well, it's a traditional figure. It's been widely used as a rule of thumb by a number of uh, investigators over the years. Uh, and there's some statistical support. It's not terribly convincing. I, I could have my mind changed, but it's laid out in footnote 9 in the working paper, and uh, it's better than nothing in our view. And so we, we have the normal view is that uh, deficits and surpluses shouldn't be larger than 3 percent of GDP. Uh, that's supplemented by a second rule. And this second rule comes from the IMF. The I, it's, a, it's a modification of the IMF's Rule 3, which you may possibly remember I talked about last year. It's one which assumes that uh, the aim of policy should be to stabilize a country's current uh, imbalance, uh, current um, uh, debt in net international investment position relative to GDP. So a country that was in debt should continue in debt, and its debt should get ever larger, but they shouldn't get larger faster than GDP. So the position of debt to GDP doesn't uh, increase. Now, as a rule, uh, that doesn't make a great deal of sense because there's clearly no particular normative significance in stabilizing the ratio of net fin financial assets to GDP at any old ratio. But it does have the great virtue that it prevents 
uh, either deficits or surpluses exploding. Uh, in other words, it rules out Ponzi type strategies. So uh, we've built this in for lar uh, countries with large absolute net ratios for net financial assets to GDP. They have large debts or they have large uh, uh, assets relative to GDP, then they are entitled to a, a larger deficit, but provided it's not going to further increase the ratio of net financial assets to GDP, which seemed to us a reasonably sensible uh, basis for uh, modifying this rule. And it's one which then dispenses with those rather arbitrary assumptions last year, where instead of 3% of GDP, we said, well, it's fine for countries like uh, Australia and uh, New Zealand to have ratios of 6% uh, of GDP. And then, well, perhaps 6% is going to explode. And so one feels that uh, is rather uncomfortable. And uh, similarly for the surplus countries, we said it's okay for Singapore and Switzerland, but we ruled it out for China and Taiwan. And China and Taiwan naturally feel that if they've already accumulated equally large surpluses, then they're entitled to continue running larger surpluses. So we've modified that to uh, uh, continue <coughs> to uh, allow them also to get caught by this second criteria. What we didn't uh, change was the assumption that the oil exporters were, would be excluded from this exercise. Uh, we, the critical assumptions there are one of the oil price and oil producer saving strategies, and we didn't feel that either of those could be forecast with uh, sufficient credence to uh, lend, uh, to, to really justify calculating uh, a fundamental equilibrium exchange rate for them. And therefore, we're assuming that uh, uh, other countries' fundamental equilibrium exchange rates are not going to be heavily dependent upon what is assumed for the oil price. Um, and it does appear from some work that we did, though we didn't report it, that uh, that's a reasonable assumption. It's not exact, but it's reasonable. <coughs> so that's uh, the, the rule for calculating uh, uh, target count accounts. We then uh, proceeded to do it, and I've got here a slide which shows uh, how we did it for some of the major countries um, and some of the major Asian countries also, as well as the industrial countries. And uh, let me just go through this briefly as regards Canada. We first of all took the IMF forecast, uh, percentage of GDP for, for 2012. They're forecasting a surplus of 0.1%. We then adjusted that in two ways. Uh, the first way was to uh, redistribute Klein's, uh, uh, the, the increase in the US count account deficit that's forecast by Klein. And so that's in, that becomes a surplus. And of course, with Canada, that's quite a big impact. And secondly, Klein is assuming a higher oil price than the IMF assumed. And that also has a favourable effect on the Canadian balance of payments. So by the time you've made those two adjusted adjustments to the Canadian current account, they're in surplus, quite definitely. Uh, we then proceeded to calculate a constant, what would be implied by holding constant the ratio of net financial assets to GDP. In the case of Canada, it's still a deficit, a debtor country, net, because although it's been in surplus in recent years, that has not historically been true, and therefore it would actually have a deficit. And so its target current account, that as we, we come there, it would be 3%, it actually went up to 3.2% because all countries get an adjustment of close to 2%, close to 0.2% of GDP, because otherwise there would be a global account account imbalance, which we don't allow, so we distributed that over all countries, and that actually pushes the Canadian target up to 3.2% of GDP. Right, and the same procedure was pursued for all the other countries. <coughs> In the case of the euro area, for example, um, there the uh, oil, the impact of the higher oil price was actually greater than the impact of a bigger US deficit. 
so that uh, their deficit increased, um, that they clearly uh, uh, would not have to uh, uh, figure at, uh, uh, th they would clearly uh, uh, be, uh, uh, th if they had a maintain constant the ratio of net financial assets to GDP, they would have a smaller surplus, not much smaller. Um, actually the target then comes out to minus 1%, so that's minus 1.2 from the second column and the 0.2 adjustment for all countries. So minus 1% of GDP is the target count account for the euro area. <coughs> and so on. Uh, one then takes the target count account changes, they are given by the, the target, uh, uh, you see that, that's uh, column 4 minus column 2, so for Canada that's minus 0.7% of GDP, that's the uh, adjusted count account. And the uh, desired change in the effective exchange rate is then the target current account change divided by an impact parameter. Now this also comes from Klein's work, and maybe he's going to talk about it. Uh, it's, it's, it is an attempt to get at a measure of how much uh, the, the current account responds to a given change in the exchange rate. Uh, and then we apply the symmetric matrix inversion model of Klein in order to get desirable changes in the dollar exchange rate. And he's going to talk about that part of the exercise in more detail shortly. So I'll skip over that and give you simply some results of the simulation. First of all, let me explain what we're uh, simulating once again. Uh, we, we have the changes in the current account. I explained how we got those. In the case of Canada, it was minus 0.7%. And then we ran the, we simulated Klein's model and it came out to minus 0.8%, which is pretty close. Uh, the change in the uh, uh, VIA, uh, it was uh, an, uh, for Canada, it indicated the desirability of an appreciation of the Canadian VIA by 2.3%. The change in the simulation was 2.4%, very similar. Uh, the dollar exchange rate in March it was uh, 1.26 and that would have meant an appreciation of the Canadian dollar of 7.6% would be needed and the fair equivalent dollar exchange rate was then a dollar 18 that's uh, uh, Canadian dollars per US dollar if one thinks of it the other way up it's 85 US cents per Canadian dollar so we did the same thing for all the other countries and uh, thereby got their fear equivalent dollar exchange rates. And then what I take it people are really interested in is how this works out, what the implications are as regards recent, uh, the recent dollar exchange rates. Uh, look at um, uh, the fear equivalent rates that we've just calculated in the previous uh, section. Uh, are listed in column 1 there and the average of this last week is listed in column 2 and then there is an estimate of one, what further change would be needed in order to achieve the fair equivalent dollar exchange rate what further change in terms of the dollar and in terms of the Canadian dollar there would actually be a need there for a depreciation the Canadian dollar has overshot uh, the euro area, there's still a very modest appreciation that would be called for. In the case of Japan, it's somewhat bigger. In the case of Switzerland, it's quite big. Uh, in the case of the UK, it's essentially zero. And uh, in the case of developing Asia, well, you can see for some countries it's big, and for some countries it's very big. One country in particular is very big. And uh, uh, the uh, uh, the set of conclusions that we reach is essentially that uh, the US dollar had achieved a renewed overvaluation in early 2009 when the IMF reported. The IMF report was based on figures for uh, March of this year, 
and uh, on that basis we thought that the dollar was severely overvalued. It, had over it was overvalued last year by about uh, 7%. This year there's an extra 10% in the dollar appreciation. So we have that 17% appreciation that you may have noticed in the earlier table. And the correction of this is going to be essential if one is going to have a sustained recovery, because otherwise well, one will have the same sort of imbalances re-emerging in the new economy, even if the present crisis is overcome, and uh, that will then uh, uh, lead to, uh, in short order, to uh, a some sort of catastrophe. Um, now, in fact, half of this increase, half of the 10% increase in the past year, had already been uh, gone by the time, by this last week, by beginning of June. Uh, so that the dollar has depreciated quite substantially. Um, that's despite the sector of the Treasury is talking of a strong dollar. Uh, really, if one means by a strong dollar an overvalued dollar, it, fortunately it's not happened. Uh, the, this overvaluation of the dollar is spread quite widely but it's clearly especially large in some Asian currencies. Um, and uh, uh, it, essentially the nature of the re realignment we would like to see is uh, one in which uh, uh, all currencies all except one or two like the Canadian dollar appreciate against the US dollar, uh, but the appreciations are much larger in the case of Asian currencies, uh, Chinese, some of the Asian currencies like Chinese renminbi, and uh, thereby make for no real change in the effective or average trade weighted exchange rate of the other countries, uh, of many of the other countries. Um, the increases in almost everywhere, the increases in the needed dollar rates are far greater than the increases in effective exchange rates. Indeed, for many countries, there really aren't any increases needed in effective exchange rates. That's true of the euro area, it's true of the pound, it's uh, true of many of the Latin American countries, it's true of even some of the smaller Asian countries. So in many cases, there really aren't uh, increases in effective rates wanted, it's an increase in the dollar rate that's appropriate. The only systemically important imbalances that remain are those of the United States and China. And because the United States floats and China doesn't, um, it's therefore important that uh, China either it pegs to a basket or it floats, or it starts crawling up against the dollar in the way that it was doing until last summer. Um, but it's really not fundamentally a question about flexibility. I think the a tendency to resort to this formula of more flexibility is not well deserved in the case of China. It's a case of the exchange rate against the renminbi, which is inappropriate, and one needs therefore to change the rhetoric in order to, to emphasize that what's important is getting the renminbi right rather than uh, getting the exchange rate regime right.